And that's I think one of my strategies that I have on LinkedIn as well is definitely like, like sometimes I'll write a post and then like I'll I'll re I'll read through it. I'm like, okay, this this is this is not what I like. This is just you know fluff. And then if you cut out all the fluff and just give people like the high value meat, like if you can say what you want to say in three or four sentences, but like you spend three paragraphs saying it, like like your post is going to bomb. But like, like, even if it's the same information conveyed, it's just that like one, like you can eat in three sentences and the other one takes like, a, you know, almost a minute to read. Like it, that, that makes a huge difference. Zach Wilson is a tech lead at Airbnb and a content creator on LinkedIn with over 150,000 followers. He's passionate about data engineering and mental health. He also has an awesome YouTube channel called Data with Zach, where he teaches people about data and data engineering. In this episode, Zach explains what it means to be a tech lead, a position that I personally was confused about. He also touches on how he was able to reach a leadership position in such a short period of time, and why he finds jumping between engineering and data roles has led to his own personal growth. Zach brings awesome energy to our conversations, and I'm happy we get to share all of this with you all. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I've obviously been acquainted with you on LinkedIn. You're posting some incredible content there. You've started to move a little bit more into YouTube as well. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to see that and to, and to share a lot of those things. But you have an incredible story, you know, moving uh, into a tech lead position at Airbnb. And I'm just so happy that you could come in and tell it. And I'm sure we'll de get pretty deep in, into the nitty gritty of data engineering and and quite a few other pretty relevant topics these days. So how are you doing? And thank you again for, for oh, oh yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, having me on this podcast. I'm, I, I love making content with people, dude. Um, I, um, I, yeah, like I'm, I'm doing really great and I, I'm really excited to talk about data, data, data engineering, all that stuff is, it's, it's my passion for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so I, I told you this and I, I tell all of my other guests offline, but for those listening, the only requirement to come on the podcast or that, that I have as a, as a podcaster is that the guest is excited about what we're talking about. And I think Zach definitely checks that box. So it's very, very <laughs> exciting for me. And Energy. We're, <laughs> we're going to have a blast. So Zach, let's dive straight into your story. So something that I'm always interested in is how did you first know that you were interested in data? Was there like a pivotal moment? Was there something that happened? Or has it been a slow progression over time and that you've gotten acquainted with this domain? Yeah, okay. So I think one of my very first things, first experiences with data was in high school, like my senior year. Uh, we did, uh, we had a capstone project, right? Of like something we had to do that was like involved. It was like, it's supposed to take the whole quarter and you're supposed to like have this really involved process with it, right? And so, you know, a lot of people did, you know, awesome things like, you know, go and work at a charity for a while and they, you know, change the world or whatever. Me, my nerdy person, uh, what, what I did was like, I was, I wanted to do an analysis of does my mood impact my um, Halo play? Like, so I was very good at Halo, like the Halo, um, you know, uh, shooter game. And I wanted to see like how my mood impacted my performance in the game, right? And I, I checked it based on a couple different scales, right? One was like, like calm to anxious. There was one that was sad to happy. There was one that was uh, like uh, relaxed to anger. And those were like the three main. And then the, then the last one was um, energized to tired to energized. So I had those four that I had to rate my mood um, kind of uh, subjectively before I played each game. And then I would record my stats at the end of the game to then, you know, have my input and, you know, kind of generate my training set for, you know, this to see like, okay, what, what's the ideal mood that Zach should be in to be at peak performance in this game. And uh, I ended up playing like some weird number of games. I think it was like a thousand games. And then like every time my mom was like, Zach, you should quit playing video games. And I'm like, I'm working on my capstone project. Like I need, I need to get more data. I'm just collecting data. That's all I'm doing. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing video games. I'm just collecting data. Anyways, uh, I did learn that like, um, like the, the most important one was the, 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 the tired to energized bar. Like, you know, if you're tired or sleepy, then like that's, that's the one that had like was way more predictive than any of the rest. But um, it, it being super angry was also um, one that was, a ne it had a negative impact on the play because like I end up being more aggressive when I'm super angry. And then like I, 
I make uh, bad calls and I rush too hard and then two people shoot at me at the same time and I get wrecked. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'd say that that was kind of like my first kind of, you know, thing with data that I did that I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. This is pretty awesome. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's like, I don't know, it, the, the thousand IQ play to say, to figure out a project that you could play video games with and just have the ultimate excuse for your parents. I, I wish I was, was that clever in high school. <laughs> Incredible stuff. So where did, where did that, you know, where did that take you, uh, you know, after that, you know, you worked on that. Did you decide to pursue yeah. something in college related to that or was it just uh I, I was I mean that was just like my first experience that I really noticed data as like wow this is a cool thing but then I kind of like actually I I, I dabbled a lot in high in high school and college uh and like so my my first declared major in college was actually pre-med so I switched from pre-med then to chemistry like organic chemistry and chemistry it was a big thing I was like super interested in and then after that I realized no nah, math is my thing and then my brother showed me programming and then I was like, ah, actually it's math and computer science. So that was kind of like my, my journey of like switching majors and checking things out and doing a bunch of stuff. I did, took a lot of classes. That was a big thing I did. Like I, I was taking like, uh, like 20 credit hours, like every, every semester just to like really kind of soak up information. Right. And, um, and that's what I, why I ideally landed on like, you know, math and computer science because they, they really fit really well together. Um, Initially, like in college and everything, like I were, like at the end of college, I was actually working on a different project that was kind of unrelated to data, but it was actually um, is this application for Magic the Gathering. Um, and what it did was you could build a deck, a Magic deck, and then you could play it. And you could put, like pretend to play it and see how it draw. Uh, you could draw the cards. You could see like how expensive the deck was, like both like in terms of like in-game mana and also in terms of like us dollars and, and then, you, then you could buy the deck online get the physical card shipped to you that was like my um my capstone project for my degree was that application and i kept working on it even after that and i like so that was such an energizing experience for me that like i actually believed that i was going to be a mobile developer that's i i had a i had a dream of being um an android and ios mobile developer when i initially graduated college and I, um, I was doing a bunch of contracting work and stuff like that. And then um, what happened was I met up with these people at this company called Red Brain Labs. And uh, they were like, dude, data science is the future. Data science is where, we, where things are gonna go. Like, and, like, and, and then they were showing me, I'm like, oh yeah, if you come and work at this company, it's a startup. There's like 20 people in the startup. 12 of the 20 people have PhDs in math. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a pretty smart company. It sounds like uh, that might be where I wanna work. And uh, that's where I like really kind of dove really head first in the data was that like, I was still doing like Android and um, uh, iOS dev on the side, like for contracting and stuff like that. Like I'm just to make a little bit of extra money because I was like an intern, uh, you know, doing data science. Cause like the, uh, the, the mobile, the mobile stuff paid way better than being a data science intern. Right. It was like, you know, like five, five times better. Right. It was, it was a very big difference. And so I did that to like make a little bit of extra money. And then I still just kind of focus more on data science. And um, yeah, and that's like where I kind of like really launched my career was there. My first job, I like did a lot with um, SQL, just like tons of SQL, SQL and like Vertica. I mean, I've heard of Vertica. Vertica is like a database, like it's like kind of like Teradata and like the other kind of analytical, like Oracle, kind of those analytical kind of, uh, you know, old school-ish databases. And um yeah, and like I did that, and then I worked with Tableau, lots of Tableau. I, I so much Tableau that I became a Tableau certified professional. I'm legit certified, right? <laughs> and, um, but yeah, like uh, I made some very fancy dashboards. It was fun, dude. That was and like that's kind of where I kind of broke into data and like really like made a career of it at that point. As a girl, I, I do want to rewind a little bit to your yeah, for sure. to your that college. Was a lot. I, I love the. <laughs> I love the project. I mean, it seems like the two projects that you articulated there were very intimately tied to your interests. I think that that's yeah. something that I think is really compelling. And it seemed like you had infinite energy to collect samples and to be able to work on those. I, I mean, so I, I dabbled with some Magic the Gathering back in the day as well. I even yeah. like maybe as last year, a couple of years ago, I, I tried the um, Magic the Gathering Arena they have they have like a, a new web 
platform now, which is which isn't that bad. Mm-hmm. And that to me is like it'd be very interesting to pursue some sort of model to to actually play that game. Right. Oh, we, yeah. we focused on closed games. We have Go, we have a lot of these things, but these open ended, like choose your deck, choose these things are such cool, complex problems. I mean, a lower hanging fruit, but still a relevant one is like Pokemon and like figuring out yep. can can an AI optimize on a game like that. Um, yeah, dude. Com- completely tangential. How long do you think we are away from being able to have someone uh, or like a, an AI that would be competitive in that? I mean, we can do, we can do StarCraft, we can do these types of things, but there's so many yeah. less moving parts than in a completely open-ended card game or something like mm-hmm. that. I think I think there's uh, there's a couple things there, like because uh, there what, one of the things that I think is interesting about the card games and stuff like that as well is that there is more of like an RNG into it, right? So I think in some some regards, I don't think that it will be possible for um, AI to ever be as like dominant as they are in, as it is in like chess, right? Or as it is in like other things because chess is almost completely like 100% skill, right? There's almost no randomness in chess at all. Whereas like uh, card games have that like shuffle deck randomness. And like, sometimes if uh, your opponent just draws the right eight cards at the beginning of a magic game, like you're done, you're done, dude, you're done, right? <laughs> it really depends on like um, how like the, the decks kind of play out. Um, so, but like, I think that like, there, there is some decent AIs now, like in like some of the magic games when you like, you can play against uh, like on like the online magic games, right? You can play against AIs that are, that are decent, but I, I haven't like seen one that was like super dominant though. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Like one of the things I did when I was building out that app, like, so that app actually got pretty successful. Like I got it, it got it to about 200,000 downloads. So like, I had like a lot of like decks, right? Uh, because like, then what they would do is they'd build a deck in the app and then that data would then also be st- stored in like my MongoDB uh, database. And, uh, and then so, and then I would export all that data into like um, SQL and like a kind of more of like a place where I can do more of like the relationship modeling. And uh, I actually built like a recommender. So what, what it would do is like, um, in, and it's how I would uh, kind of build like the, like people also saw this card. So like if you viewed uh, like in the card detail in the app, there would be a little carousel at the bottom that is like cards that are that, uh, that are paired with this card, kind of like a wine pairing thing, right? Where it's like every card, like you look at the decks so that a card is in and then you see what, what, what cards also show up the most in those decks um, for that card, like excluding really, you know, common things like land and stuff like that, but like, Mo, like the rest of the cards right and uh that was a really cool way to like kind of build like a, a basic recommender right no statistics no regression it was all just a, a recommendation system based on counts right and like it did pretty well like i i honestly thought the recommendations were pretty good so um yeah that was that was fun like that was i kind of dabbled in like the ai ml stuff there as well that was it was a fun little project as well for sure that's awesome well, wisdom of the crowds is is always pretty compelling and we mm-hmm. also i don't know i like a super interesting space that's one of those where like i feel like i'd want to go down that rabbit hole but i would get completely lost and not want to do anything else for a while and i'll yeah. put that off for, for a later <laughs> day um you know i i am interested in sort of how you made that that first career transition into data. So you had the internship and you, you mm-hmm. talked a little bit about, you know, sort of what your, your first job was like, but what was that prog- process like kind of breaking in and, and, yeah. um, and eventually I, did you keep doing the iOS development or the Android development or did, did that stop? Yeah. Until so more? Uh, that's a, that's a great question. So like the internship was like three months and then I got a full-time offer from the same company. And then I stayed there for about another nine months. Uh, the reason why I left that company was they actually got acquired. So they were like a little startup called Red Brain Labs. And then they got acquired by Savvy Sherpa. And Savvy Sherpa is actually a, uh, is a subsidiary of United Healthcare Group. And so like after like the startup culture kind of was disappeared, I, I was like, I won't work here anymore. This company is, it's not as inspiring as it was when I started. And, um, and so then I went and I got a job at Teradata uh, um, doing data engineering, right? Doing like, uh, doing like big data and stuff like that. Um, a big thing that was important for me back then was knowing, I, and I had to do a lot of studying and research on this stuff, was I had to know a lot about, about Linux. Linux is super important, like Linux, Unix, 
That's one of the reasons why I like coding on a Mac, right? Is because Mac and Linux are like, the, the command line is like the same for the most part, right? And so like you get the benefit, if you're on a Mac, you just get Linux for free. But if you're on Windows, it's like, oh, it's a completely set, it's different set of commands at the, at the terminal, right? I, I and, will um, say yeah. now with WSL2, yeah. Linux has been very easy to use on, on the Windows machines I've found. It has? Yeah, yeah that's I awesome. highly, I, I highly switched, recommend it. Yeah, I switched in 2014. I switched when I uh, graduated college from Windows to Mac, and I have not looked back. It's been like eight years. <laughs> um, and I'm like, sure, Apple, here's another like whatever ridiculous sum of money for the next one is, right? Um, <laughs> but like, um, so Linux is important. Another thing was like Java. One of the things that was really nice uh, was that I was very good at Android development, right? And uh, Android development is also in Java, right? So doing Android development and then like Java MapReduce and Hadoop and big data, those all those big data technologies are all like, it's all based on Java, right? And so that was made it easier for me to like get into that new space because I already knew the language pretty well. And um, I was able to, you know, ace the coding interview. Coding interview was like really easy. Like I, uh, it was like one of those like easy fizz buzz ones and they just wanted to hear my thought process. It was like, a, it, it was so easy. And um, and the, the the Linux questions were the was the hardest section for me. Like where I like I felt like I failed, and then I actually thought I didn't get the job, and I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, I guess I'm still at Savvy Sherpa for a little bit. But then they called me and they're like, yeah, we want you to be hired here. And uh, yeah, uh, Terranator was great. Like, um, I kept doing um, so like when I went from uh, uh, Red Brain Labs to Teradata. So at Red Brain Labs, I uh, I was making about like fifty thousand dollars a year at, in, in Utah, right? And then uh, when I moved to um, Teradata, it went from 50 to 80, 50,000 to 80,000. And, I was, and I'm like, at the time I was like, I'm a big baller, dude, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe I got that much of a raise. That was crazy. And, um, uh, and then I, um, I worked at Teradata for a while, um, but then I realized I didn't want to live in Utah anymore. I got sick of Utah. Utah was like the problem. And then I was like, I need to move, right? And then uh, I worked at Teradata for like seven months which was like, it was like my shortest time. My shortest time was at Teradata, like of all my you know, companies. And uh, then I moved to DC to work at research, this company called Research Innovations, which was just like, and I was just doing back end there. I wasn't doing data. I was just doing like back end development and like a, a bit of full stack, but mostly back end development. That's what I did at uh, that company. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's kind of crazy. And then I got the job at Facebook after that. That was kind of like the kind of the transition to Facebook. I, I, I've had this kind of pattern in my career where I've kind of like, um kind of swung back and forth between like traditional software engineering like mobile dev back end dev full stack dev and then kind of swaying back more into like data like data science data ml and then kind of swaying back again right i've done that like so many times like because <laughs> like teradata was like data eng research innovations was software eng facebook was data eng right Netflix was software end, right? And now Airbnb is data end, right? I've, I've done I've done the hop, like, do, 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 do. It's been freaking insane, like, but also awesome. Like, it's kept me fresh, kept me nimble, you know? Yeah, I was going to ask, why do you think that is? And I mean, like, you know, you mm -hmm. say it's a pattern, but is there some design in that pattern? Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, I constantly find myself trying to, with my work and with content and consulting and stuff, I try, try to find myself like working on different things across the, the platforms. Like if mm -hmm. I have to do a lot of coding for my YouTube videos and I'm doing a project there, I don't really want to be coding in my, uh, in my like nine to five job as much then, right? I'm yeah. trying to outsource. I'm trying to do more client facing stuff and vice versa when I'm, when I'm doing mm -hmm. more talking head. Um, yeah. You know, is it something that like, hey, you get, a, it can get a little overwhelming and like you get to work some different muscles and then you come back or is it just like, hey, these are how the opportunities lined up. Like with software engineering, maybe there's more appetite for software engineers who have really good data background. And when you mm -hmm. go back to data engineering, maybe there's more appetite for data engineers who are pretty up to date with their software engineering ability. Oh yeah, and um, that's a big thing at Airbnb actually. So um, like Airbnb actually doesn't have that many data engineers right, compared to like other companies, uh, but like um, they really hire for like data engineers who have strong software engineering skills because like one like all the pipelines we write are in Scala, right? We we write Scala code at Airbnb for our data pipelines, right? Which is like you should compared to a lot of other companies that's very different, right? And uh, we also have unit tests and integration tests and all that stuff, which is another thing that is 
kind of different from, uh, um, especially from Facebook, but also um, a bit different from Netflix as well. Like there's, uh, there's an even higher degree of like software engineering rigor um, on the data pipelines at Airbnb that I've noticed for sure. Like it's, that's, all, that's one of the things that's so awesome about my role right now, right? Is that I kind of get to do both, right? And that's one of the things that's like, I feel like it, it, that's why this role fits, fits really well for me, right? And it, I, I'm, I feel very fulfilled in that regard here right now. It's pretty cool. Excellent. Well, I, I think it would be too silly a question to ask what the difference between a software engineer and a data engineer is. But I think yeah. it would be practical to say what could maybe most data engineers learn from software engineering and possibly mm. vice versa. What, what do you think? About oh, that? that's a great question. Oh, dude. Really good question, sir, man. Okay, um, so uh, for, on the data engineering side, right, I think that data engineers, what they can learn from software engineers, right, is a big thing is around like having good like on-call processes and how to do better maintenance of stuff, right? And because sometimes like, like, that's one of the things that's kind of fundamentally different between data eng and software eng is that software engineers generally have like online systems that like when they fail, they need like, you need to actually go and respond pretty quickly because it's like down and the server's down and someone's expecting to use the thing, right? But in data pipelines, it's like, oh, the data is just delayed, right? It's delayed by like a certain X number of hours or whatever, right? And so like, there's like, oh, the data, data engineers generally don't care about like having good solid on-call processes as much. But I, I, for me, I, I think that that's actually one of the most important things that a data engineer can do is hit SLA as much as they possibly can, right? And a big part of that is managing on-call and how, like, okay, what do we do when things break? And then like other things like for data quality checks, right? It's like, okay, say it barely fails. Say it's barely outside the threshold. Do you just let it, like you just skip the check and let it run or do you have to escalate it? Like how do you troubleshoot data quality bugs, right? And kind of like that whole rigor and process around on-call and um, kind of managing that stuff is something that like, I don't think that data engineers like generally need to do as much, but like if they do it, like that, that, that's how you really get to like a really high level of like engineering excellence, right? I think on the flip side, like um, some things that software engineers can learn from data engineers, right? Um, a, a couple of them are like, one is around like efficient data modeling, right? And how like really trying to compact that data as much as you can. And also like uh, not just that, but also like usable data models, right? And understanding how to like write data that's easy to query and write data that like is easy to move around or do whatever you need to do with it. and like. I think that that kind of modeling and uh, that kind of stuff, modeling and query patterns is something that I think data engineers are generally really good at, but software engineers write pipelines too, right? And they need to write data out to stuff. And I've just seen a lot of times in those cases where I've like taken over a, a pipeline that was written by a software engineer and then they write everything like, but then like it's, uh, but the data is like inefficient or like they didn't take the right or they didn't leverage Spark the right way. Like maybe they should have written more or more files or fewer files, or maybe they needed to tune the Spark job a little bit. Things like that as well that are like just you know nitty gritty technical things as well. But I'd say that that's like those are the things that I think they can learn from each other. So I, I have sort of a follow up question to that. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at different organizations, they organize teams in different ways. So I've worked in and consulted in places where data teams were completely separate from software engineering teams. Mm -hmm. I've worked at places where they were both under the same umbrella. And you know, like yeah. the, the software engineers, data engineers, data scientists were all effectively working in the, in the same group and on the same projects under the yeah. same uh, person. Um, where, I've been in both teams too. Like, uh, like uh, Facebook and Netflix have it, they're more like centralized, right? Where like, uh, like at Facebook, I was on a team of just data engineers. And then at Netflix, I was on a team of just data people, like DEs and DS essentially were all on the same team, but that, and then that was it. And then Airbnb, it's like, uh, like we're just, an, we're, we're part of Eng, right? We're mostly part of Eng, right? And so that's where it can be a little bit tricky for like in the kind of the more embedded model that you're talking about, it can be kind of a little bit more tricky to do some of this stuff for sure. Yeah. What were some of the sort of like, I don't want, you don't have to go too in depth, but what were some of like yeah. the benefits and drawbacks of both? I think, um, yeah. obviously there are two different models and there's going to be complexity. Um, mm -hmm. also relationships are very different. If you're like throwing something over a fence to, to the engineering teams versus having to sit next to the person who is working on the project right after you do, uh, or, mm -hmm. or like in parallel with them. 
you know, I, 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 that, that to me is so fascinating because most people have not had that experience of working in teams that are structured differently like you and I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is great. I actually talked about like in my Ukraine webinar, I actually spent like five, 10 minutes talking about this exact what we're talking about right here. Um, so uh, I think like when I think back on like the, the pros of being on a centralized team, like uh, there's a couple of them. One is that robustness, right? Where you can really uh, like, like, for example, like you're only on call maybe like once a quarter, like if you have a big team, right? Or like depending on how centralized it is, right? Uh, that's a big thing that can help is like you have this kind of diffusion of like that maintenance, the maintenance responsibility gets kind of distributed across, which is great. And like, you can have a lot of really good um, things there, but you're totally right. Like throwing things over the fence. Cause like, uh, then you have to work with the manager and like prioritization. Right. And then like you know, specific product teams might have to wait. They might have to wait three, six months, depending on how we, how, how the centralized team ends up prioritizing things. Right. But in the embedded model, they can like, they they can plan more effectively because they are just with the they're in in the embedded teams sitting with them like you like you said and so that's kind of like a, a trade-off there is like the pr prioritization complexity is a little bit different i think like with centralized versus embedded i think on the flip side though for embedded kind of the minus is there is like uh you have to train people you really do like i mean like for me i'm on a team that doesn't have very many data engineers but we have like a lot of back-end engineers and like some other like you know uh like ml engineers and stuff like that and like we want to uh like we should all be able to you know uh, unblock a pipeline right and uh be part of that maintenance and diffuse the maintenance across right just because it's a, a pipeline doesn't mean it has to be restarted by a data engineer right i think that like but that cost you like most data engineers know how to do that just because of like experience and they've been in that you know boat and like sometimes those other roles haven't and so you have to like teach them how to do on call but like it's worth it it's definitely worth it like um and um i think that another thing with with the embedded model that can be trickier is like it feels like um getting the right like knowledge sharing and career support and stuff like that like because working with people more senior than you, like that was what happened. At, that's what that's what I did at Facebook, and like it was amazing. It was so amazing being able to work with people who were just like better than me. But if you're the only data engineer on the team, like how do you work with people who are better than you at data engineering? Right, you can't. Right, <laughs> and so um, like I think that that's kind of a, uh, one of the things that you really need to work with your manager on to like understand how you can grow your career better. So yeah, I'd say that those are kind of like the pros and cons, embedded versus centralized. You know. I love yeah. that. I mean, so, so something that I, I see where embedded, I wouldn't say it breaks down, but it becomes a little bit more difficult. So I think software engineering and data engineering, and even like the other end of the spectrum, like ML engineering, those can generally be run very effectively or like managed in a similar way. Once mm -hmm. you get, you know, once you start working with data analysts, data scientists, where the nature of the work can be a little bit more exploratory. I think project management systems can still be effective, but they break down a little bit because the nature yeah. of the work is a little bit different. Like within an embedded team, how do you manage those slightly different expectations or slightly different styles of work? Because I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's might not be a correct answer to that because that, that's a problem I yeah. see almost everywhere. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, you know, do, do you have any thoughts on that or? You know, yeah. like some parts should be wholly in project management or some parts should just be run different. I think, well, I think that there's uh, one, one thing that I think is important here is that like, there's a lot of uh, teams out there who think that like data scientists really need to be a part of like daily standups. Cause you know how like standups and agile and software engineering, like those things all go like hand in hand. Like that's like a very common pattern. And that like is usually pretty effective in software engineering because it's like such more of like a builder pattern, right? And like you're creating and building infrastructure and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more predictable, but you're totally right. in like the data science and like exploratory spaces, like the um the iteration cycles are just longer as well right so for my team what we do is like we kind of do a middle ground where we just have like a weekly check-in or we just we check in once a week to talk about the progress of stuff right so that like it's not like as demanding right uh that's pretty that that, that helps a lot like try, trying to meet somewhere in the middle right and like assuming that like uh that there's not as many blockers for uh, the software engineers and, and in those cases i work with them on more like how to like 
be better async, right? And talk with, talk things through over Slack because a lot of times we, you can, Slack's powerful, man. You can really do a lot of async goodness there, right? And minim, minimizing meetings, I'm all about that. All about that for sure. But like, um, I think that uh, it's definitely tricky. I think if like, your, your company doesn't have good career ladders defined as well, if everyone is like on the same team and they all have the same kind of expectations, that's going to be bad too, right? It's, it's tricky for sure. I, I, I've never been a manager like that where like I've had to manage like multiple different types of people that like, uh, yeah, for sure. So that's, I, I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to, you know, have an answer there. Like, <laughs> totally fair. Well, you know, that brings up sort of your current work and your role and what the expectations are. I mean, so you're in the tech mm. lead position. Can you mm. walk me through what it means to be a tech lead? Like what are some of the responsibilities and like, how does someone yeah. like aim for a role like that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, for me, uh, one of the big things I try to um, work with my manager on is like having like a 50 50 split between like productive, like creative work and 50% working on like unblocking people and, you know, prioritization and planning and design and all that stuff. And so um, like, that's uh, the big thing. Like, I actually, um, I feel like I initially got into the tech lead role in my second year at Netflix when I uh, was working there. They don't have like titles there really. Everyone's just a senior software engineer, but the responsibilities that I had then are similar to the ones I have now. So like, I, it feels like similar in that regard. But um, I think uh, a couple of things about tech lead is, so I will work on like prioritization, right? So one of the big differences between tech lead and like senior engineer is that you, you're, you're picking which projects should be done first, right? And the order and like how we actually spend the engineering resources, right? And taking the risks and moving things around and negotiating with people and trying to figure out like, okay, how do we get this request in? And what do we give up if we take, if we take on this? Because we only have so, so, so many, you know, hours to deliver on stuff. Um, there's a lot of that, right? And, there's, and that takes just a lot of effort. It's like more of the managerial side of it, right? I also feel that tech leads have like, a responsibility to mentor people and grow people and uh, define best practices, right? And have a way of like being like, okay, here is the best way for us to write a data pipeline, or here's the best way that we should do this or that, right? And like kind of have good best practices and get those adopted throughout the, you know, your whole org or like whoever you're working with. Um, that's another thing. I think that's kind of a difference. Uh, and then on the technical side, um, I think that the big thing is like, we take on the most, uh, tech leads usually take on the most complex and um, risky um, technical projects, right? And so that they can be, be more likely to deliver, you know, strong value there. That's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, kind of how it works. Like some weeks, you know, I shoot for 50-50 manager and um, a technical, but like, it's never like that. Some weeks are like almost 100% manager. Some weeks are 100% technical, right? And that's like, when it's like that, I'm always like, oh, that's too much. Well, on either side, it's too much, right? And I do like it when it's more like 50-50, but, you know, got to roll with the punches sometimes, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is I always try to look at things in terms of longer chunks of time. And so you're like, oh, you know, if half the days I spend doing the managerial and half the days I spend doing the technical, technically it all, it nets out to 50, 50. Yeah, if I exactly. stretch the time frame bigger and bigger. Yeah, as long, yeah, like it, once you have enough samples of days, right. It, 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 that's the, that's the expected value, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, you know, something that I think a lot of people are maybe confused about just by the nature of the title is, mm. is there one tech lead? Or they're tech leads mm. for different verticals, or they're tech leads for different, um, you know, products, or you know, how does that role break down? I mean, obviously that's different for different companies, but but what does mm. that mean? And like, uh, yeah, for sure. Like, um, so I can I can kind of like explain like kind of how my role works and everything. So I I work as a tech lead uh, for a team called Commercial Products, which is actually a, a, it's it's a it's an org of like over a hundred people. And, uh, and so what, for me, why I'm like, why I'm a tech lead is I, I manage the data quality for the org. That's like, and it's like a, so one of the things that's important there is it's like a big scope, big scope, right. Of like usually multiple teams, right. Where that are involved to like manage these kind of things, at least in big tech, like tech lead, technical lead in like other cases can be like just working with one team to build maybe a complex project. Right. Cause there's essentially two types of tech leads, right. You have like a depth tech lead because you can also have a tech lead that's like I'm really good at machine learning or computer vision or some very like specialist kind of area 
and they and they have a, a very strong depth, right? You can also have tech leads that have very strong breadth that uh, are very uh, good at unblocking people and connecting a bunch of teams and integrating APIs and getting all that stuff working. So it, one of the things that's different about how you grow after a scene, after being a senior engineer is that it's, it's a lot more like choose your own adventure, right? It's a lot more very like, like, like what, what, what do you think you're good at? Like, do you want to be more like wide or depth and like, like, how do you want to bet on your skills? Right. Um, I think for me, I, 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 I'm more of like a breadth, uh, like a kind of a breadth um, tech lead in terms of just like, cause I, I have that software skill set and the data engineering skill set. And then I work in data quality, which is like, kind of like touches a bunch of things, right? It's like, okay, logging is one piece of it, which is gonna be like front end and mobile stuff, right? And then we have like all the different data pipeline pieces. And it's like, it touches a lot of things as opposed to being like, I'm very good at like random forest and making a prediction on data, right? Where it's like, that's like a little bit more contained and like, like uh, but, but has a lot of depth to it as well, you know? So yeah, it's like, I think that, that that's kind of like the two types of tech leads and how they kind of work, you know? So I mean, in like very probably overly simplistic terms, I mean, do you think a, a suitable description of a tech lead is like maybe a part uh, engineer, part like program manager or product owner? You're, you're kind yeah. of, you, you know, you're, I, I think you obviously have significantly more hands on knowledge than like a product manager or, or like a, mm -hmm. a, a project manager, but you still have that. Uh, you're still doing a lot of the prioritization. You're still like guiding vision and, and managing people in a certain way. It's very, very, very cool. And it's a little bit different, difficult to, to conceptualize, I think, for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, um, it's, it's definitely uh, it's an interesting role. And I, I've, I've really been liking it, though. So for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how would someone who wants to become a tech lead, how would they like angle for a position like that? Okay, I, I think the first one there is like to really uh, get good at like delivering like complex software projects, right? Like if you can deliver strong value and big value on a complex piece of software and you can do that maybe consistently over a little while, that's how you really can get that kind of foundation that's ready to like potentially be a tech lead. Uh, then like once you have that, that's kind of like the software, senior software skill set, like especially as you get kind of deeper into your senior career, you should be like also mentoring people and growing people and teaching people and kind of sending the ladder down and like getting better at those soft skills and those mentoring skills and those upskilling of people skills. And um, cause that will make you a way better tech lead as well. Um, and once you have that kind of experience and you have like the track record for uh, of delivery, then it's, pretty straightforward to like actually get the tech lead role you can actually land it after that like the depending on like things you still get asked like dsa questions right and you're going to be uh, do, definitely leak coded up right i i leak coded before my airbnb interview i mean i didn't leak code a ton didn't like it was like maybe like i spent like 10 10 hours on it right I'm, because i don't I, i'm also not an advocate for like you know, leak code all the questions or whatever, you know, that's, that's too much. <laughs> but um, I think that uh, those are kind of the, the big things, right, is you need to get those soft skills, right, managing people, managing expectations, prioritization, because sometimes you're going to need to tell someone that their, pro their project is going to have to wait, stuff like that, and getting good at that stuff is important, for sure. So, I mean, you, you touched on this a little bit, but how, how do you go about building those soft skills as much as possible is it just reps experience talking with mm -hmm. people or is it um something beyond that yeah that's a great question i think a couple things there uh, a big part of it is reps and like um talking to a bunch of people like one of the things for me is that like i really like to try to build relationships with a kind of a, a bunch of different people right try to understand uh people's emotions and just really interacting with humans right and kind of do, 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 do the humaning thing. Right. And I think that that's a big thing. Like reps is a big one. I think another one though, is like taking risks, right. Because like, sometimes like uh, you want to get in those reps of like communication when it does count. Right. And when like, when it will make a big difference. And um, so if you can take like risks in those situations to understand things, right. And to, or until like, and be able to communicate those risks in a way that's effective. Right. And kind of get used to the, a little bit more like 
higher stakes communication, right? And understanding like like what your words do and like how they how they you know change things and influence things and, and impact things. That is like another thing that I think is important. That is and and that's that does come with reps, but it also comes with like it's reps, but you can't just keep you can't just keep repping the bar, right? You have to like yeah, I gotta put like a little bit more weight on the sides of it to like be able to kind of keep communicating well in, in situations that have a, a bit more pressure and a bit more pressure, you know? Yeah. Love that. I, I think you're forgetting the most important one, which is to uh, listen to podcasts fairly yes. right, weekly. And not to <laughs> yes, yes, dude, for sure. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, no, I, you know, I, I love that. That, that to me is, is so fascinating. And, and you know, thank you for sharing those types of things. I mean, something you're also, you're pretty well known for is also sharing a lot of information that you've learned and from your experiences on LinkedIn and, and now on YouTube. I'd love to hear about, you know, transitioning a little bit from your work, but more about like building a brand and telling stories and like making, yeah. creating value publicly, you know, what is your philosophy on that? Well, that's, that's a good one. So I, I think there's a couple things there. Like um, building a brand has been, first off, it's been really amazing. I highly recommend it to most people. Um, I, uh, I've been doing it for about a year ish now. I really started in like about February, like essentially right when I started at Airbnb was when I really started to, you know, be very consistent on LinkedIn and like post. Um, I think that one of the things is, is about habits, right? Because um, habits are like super important to build because like for me, I've actually been creating content for a very long time. Like, uh, I, like I've been posting uh, almost daily Facebook posts since about 2009. So like I've been doing this for like almost a decade in terms of just like writing and um, just like writing my thoughts for the day. Right. I'm looking at those 2009 posts. I'm always like, Zach, you were an idiot. Like, <laughs> but um, like I so I, I've, I've, I've really liked to, to write for a, a very long time. I, I that so that's been a, for me, that's been the, one of the most important pieces, I think, of this brand journey has been writing things that people like are interested in and that they get value from, right? And so I think that like, that's a big thing that I think is important of like that stuff. That's why YouTube's actually been challenging for me, right? Is because like, it, 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 hasn't, it, it hasn't felt like, a, it hasn't felt like it fit like a glove like LinkedIn, right? Cause like I've been practicing writing for freaking so long, right? And video is just like different. It's, it's a different animal. It's a, just a different beast completely. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning though. I feel like, I feel like as I keep practicing, I'm going to get better at that stuff. It's, 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 it's interesting for sure. Like, mm -hmm. well, I, I love the habituation conversation and, and even the story of revisiting your old, your old posts. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, I think part of content should be for yourself and for retrospection and looking back and saying, Hey, this is a catalog of all the things that I've been learning. And mm -hmm. I can go back and see that if I ever need a reminder of who I am or the things that I picked up. But the other added benefit is other people can see, see this and, and pick something up from my experiences as well. I mean, I love podcasting as a platform because selfishly, I get to ask awesome guests like you, whatever questions that I have about, you know, like your experiences mm -hmm. and your work and I get to learn, yeah, but definitely. everyone else gets to tune in and listen and, and share the experience as well. And, you know, there's just this really unique double, like internal and external benefit that you get from producing in this way. And, you know, a lot of people think, I, I, I want to make sure that, that people realize that like, it isn't all for creating value, right? Like that is really important. No one will mm -hmm. watch your content if value isn't created, but it's mm -hmm. totally fine if the motivation for making content is partly for you because your motivation will be higher, like just like your projects, right? Mm -hmm. Halo and Magic the Gathering, right? Like you're mm -hmm. motivated to do those things because you actually care about the outcomes. You know, if, mm -hmm. if I'm posting every day because I care about, um, you know, reminding myself of my story or sharing what I'm working on and I get happiness or excitement or I feel accepted because of those things, that's a perfectly good reason to go out and produce and create these habits. Um, and I think that yep. that gets overlooked a lot. A lot of people are like, oh, it's such a slog. It's such a grind to produce things. And I'm like, no, if, if you are producing the content because you, you like it, right? Like I have fun when I make my videos. Yeah, for sure. Like it's a lot easier to do it that way. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. But you got to be playful with stuff, dude. And, and kind of channel that inner child and like, just do write things the, like for the sake of writing them and like, and realizing that like, you can like a lot of times if you, it, that, that, that also is kind of a secret sauce as well. Right. Because like, if you are playful and you're, are having fun with it, sometimes you write better content because it's more sincere. Right. And it's more like, Oh yeah, I'm speaking from a place of like who I truly am not Oh, hi, I'm professional, Zach. I wear a suit and tie and like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I just got into Google, do, 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 right? You know, like some like automaton robot guy, right? That like, there's a lot of posts on LinkedIn like that, that just bomb and they don't, they don't go anywhere because they're so, there's like so yawn, right? And so like, <laughs> like, get out of here, dude. Like, I get that you want to be like, a, like you want to present yourself as like professional, but like, you have no flavor. Like you have no, <laughs> there's nothing going on here, dude. This is all bland, right? And uh, I think that like that kind of like building of your own flavor, like I, at least for me, that kind of playfulness of like building your own flavor is like, it's great because like it, it, you can, you can refine it and it's a, it's a craft and an art and you can get better at it. You can learn and grow. And like, I definitely know I've gotten like just committing to, right. Cause last year, last year I posted seven, 700 times on LinkedIn. Right. And, um, and so like, that's a lot of posts, right? That was like, you know, it was almost two a day, right? Um, uh, and so like, uh, that was, like, I learned a lot from that, just the, those, those habits and that consistency, you know? And that's, and I feel so good about it though, because now that I can write, I know I can like, like just get into people's heads and change the world, dude, right? <laughs> like, it's awesome. Well, actually, I mean, I think a lot of people overlook the importance of writing, especially mm -hmm. post-pandemic. I would argue the main way we communicate with people now for the majority of people in technical careers is through through writing, not as much through mm. talking, right? You do stand yep. up in the morning and then the rest of the day you're communicating via Slack for the most yep. part or, or one of the other platforms or, or email or whatever it is. And to be yep. able to convey information very clearly and get people to read it and, and understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. unbelievably valuable skill. And, you know, if I'm hiring someone, I look at blog content that they write. Can they, can this person yep. write it? If that's how I'm going to be communicating with them most of the time, like mm -hmm. it, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to also showcase that in any of the content you create and, and to get better at that as a medium in and of itself. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. It's, um, and that's, I think one of my strategies that I have on LinkedIn as well is definitely like, like sometimes I'll write a post and then like, I'll, I'll read, I'll read through it. I'm like, okay, this, this is, this is not what I like. This is just, you know, fluff. And then if you cut out all the fluff and just give people like the high value meat, like if you can say what you want to say in three or four sentences, but like you spend three paragraphs saying it, like, like your post is going to bomb. But like, like, even if it's the same information conveyed, it's just that like one, like you can eat in three sentences. Another one takes like, a, you know, almost a minute to read. Like it, that, that makes a huge difference. Right. And like really, conveying things like succinctly and like just getting into people's heads like that's uh, and, and you, you got to respect people's time too that's one of the things I think a lot of creators forget is that like they feel that like the algorithm means that they're entitled to engagement and and to and to reach right because a lot you know you see these creators on LinkedIn that are like oh no the algorithm changed and now my content doesn't do as well and it's like um like there could be like quality reasons for that but also like you have freaking uh, your your audience gets to decide that, right? Because highly engaging content, content that people like and love is always going to do well. That's just how it works. That's how content works, right? And like an out, like if an out, like if your content strategy is so shaky that like an algorithm change just like derails you, then you need to rethink your strategy because there's probably something you're missing or something that you could do as well to, you know, make your content better. So like, it's definitely... It's an interesting journey for sure though. Like, <laughs> well, the, the time sensitivity is really interesting for two reasons related to YouTube is that YouTube doesn't value the user's time, right? So YouTube, I, my goal is to get the person to watch as long as possible, right? Mm -hmm. It's not to get, convey the information in as concise and digestible a way as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's the exact opposite of what someone learns in business school or in any of these places, it's like, Hey, get to the point. Don't waste anyone's time. Like start with the important details. And I personally mm -hmm. find that very challenging when creating content, because I just mm -hmm. want to be like, Hey, like, these are the things you should know. This is why, but like, you really don't have to keep going on, but it's mm -hmm. difficult to continue to like perpetuate your content with the algorithms 
if you're not playing the game of telling like long convoluted stories. And so finding finding the art in that of being able to to like tell a longer story and make it compelling and make people want to follow along is something that's been very novel and a little bit difficult for me because I like mm-hmm. to get to the point. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I find that very interesting. Like, it, you know, that might be one of the reasons why you're like, man, YouTube is, it's harder for me to motivate because you have to tell a story in like a very inefficient way. Right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so one of the things I am interested in, uh, I mean, obviously there's been just consistency. You've, you've made 700 posts. Um, you've put yourself out there a lot. A lot of people struggle with the risk-taking element that you described before. Um, mm-hmm. How do you experiment? How do you, uh, whether it's with interpersonal communication with a post or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. how do you take those calculated risks without going too far? Without um, going, that's and- a good one. That's a very good one. Like, I think there's a couple things there. Like, I think one piece of it that I, when when I'm writing content, I think like, okay, who am I really going to help here? And like, is this going to, is this going to help them enough that like, it's worth the risk. Right. And it's worth the, um, and some of it, like I've realized that like, there's a lot of things that people think are risky, but actually aren't risky. I mean, like, I mean, I've definitely made mistakes. I've made big mistakes in my content I've taken risks that were too far. I, I've gone like, there's definitely, I've deleted a lot of posts. So I probably deleted like a hundred posts. Cause I'm like, no, nah, this is like for a couple of reasons, like either like it's a low quality post or like, I like, I write it and then I'm like, actually, like, I don't think I actually believe that. That's just like, I'm just writing right now for like engagement or I'm just writing for whatever reason, right? And I, a couple times last year, right, I um, I actually landed on like LinkedIn lunatics, right? And I'm like, yeah, uh, I need to be better. Like, I need to like, uh, I, not those, uh, and I'm like, and rightfully so, honestly, rightfully so, right? I give them, I give like, honestly, like the internet, like, like was like, no, Zach, you're being dumb. And like, I had to think about it for a little bit and like, and I'm like, yeah, internet, actually you win this round. Like I, I, I messed up that, that, that content was too far. And so, um, <laughs> so uh, like it's tricky. Right. And, uh, but I've learned and the, you get feedback, right. You get feedback pretty quickly. Like if your content is like, I don't know, too controversial or too like on the line or whatever, or like, and you get it two ways. You either get like internet hate from it, right? You get people who post your shit on LinkedIn lunatics, right? And then they like, you know, you get you get hate or you um, or you get no engagement, right? Or it's just dead, right? It just dies. And you, so you, it's either, the, those are the ways that I recognize that like the risk didn't pay off, right? Is like, you, you're gonna get stuff in one of those two buckets. But there's a third bucket, which is just like, there's also just like generic haters on the internet as well that like, just like to post to like take you down and tear you down. Those people don't listen to those people, like really just block those people, right? Because like there's all there are people out there who are just their feedback isn't worth anything, right? Their feedback is not even feedback; it's like a put down, right? It's just like a um, you know, it's negative negativity. So yeah, this, yeah, yeah, that's definitely tricky though. The, the risk taking, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I think that I, I consider myself a fairly conservative, um, like risk taker on social platforms. But if mm-hmm. I was trying to maximize reach and output, I would sig- be significantly more controversial. Like if you take a side on something, that is almost certainly what drives interest and drives a lot of things. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. as of yet, my goal is not to become like the biggest, most controversial data, data YouTuber podcaster as it is. But I mean, oh, that, yeah. that is an important thing. Like, it, it, you know, if you're just giving like, non-spicy takes all the time mm-hmm. like everyone here is non-spicy takes all the time right like it's boring yeah like people people want the excitement people want to see like a battle in the comment section comment section mm-hmm. um and like you know like a friendly one but like it, mm-hmm. that to me is is really relevant um you know something you also said about about the the haters on the internet is that there are there are plenty of them out there and you try to listen to you know you try to take feedback when it is valid and you know something Mm -hmm. something that i really struggle with is for it's a silly thing but my youtube thumbnails there's like Mm -hmm. one or two people that just keep saying that they're clickbait and they're going to unsubscribe and all this type of stuff and to me like that's hurtful like i work really hard i'm trying to like there's an, an equation like you have to have some intrigue you have to have some reason for people to click on the videos 
to get people to watch for you to drive the most value to people, right? If, oh, yeah. if, if they don't watch your video, they, they can't learn from it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's like part of the, the, the structure. It's part of the, the whole process of YouTube or LinkedIn or any of these, you have to have a hook. Right. Yep. And I did a lot of, but to, to solve this, I just look at research. I pull, ask poll questions. I, I pull the broader reach of my audience. And if you know, like 10% of people are saying that my thumbnails are too clickbaity, it's probably too much. Right. Yeah. But if it's mm-hmm. a super vocal minority, whereas the majority really doesn't care and they find it fun and interesting and they're like, hey, this is funny. Like, um, you know, look how mm-hmm. goofy he looks in this. Like, it, it, like who, using data, you can dispel, all, you, you can really get down to what is truthful and not truthful. And rather than just like vo- let, letting vocal minorities really, um, really crush your, your self-esteem or your, your confidence in your work. Oh yeah. It's like, yeah, you don't want the, like, you don't want to fall victim to like the squeakiest wheel gets the grease sort of, you know, mentality. You actually got to look like, is there enough of these people here? Right. For sure. (laughs) Uh, That, that is really all the questions that I had. I I do have a couple user written in questions. We, we answered most of them actually on the, um, uh, it, throughout our, our general conversation. Uh, one is, you know, they're very interested in when you're visiting Texas for a talk. I don't know if that's on your plan, Ooh, but that sounds uh, interesting. Yeah. I, Texas is a good place, dude. I love that state, dude. Yeah. yeah sure. I, I'm actually <laughs> contemplating a, a move to Texas. So yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I know the question is addressed to you, but to this person, mm-hmm. you know, if you really want, you can get yeah. second best. Yeah. We, yeah. We can get both. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, and you know, David here is asking for what are some of the applications of data science or data engineering in more commercial products? Obviously a bit, bit more of a general question, but yeah. um, you know, you have worked at quite a few commercial products here. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there's a bunch, right? I mean, like you can use like uh, just a couple that I've worked with, right? You can use data science to predict account compromise, right? In like cybersecurity, right? You can use data science to predict like revenue and do revenue forecasting, right? Of like, like how much, um, how, how much revenue is the company going to make, right? That's like another kind of predictive sort of modeling thing. And it, you can also do things like uh, on the other side, like you can do data science to figure out like, okay, which notification should I send to this person to have the highest chance that they click on it? And things like that as well. Those are those are probably the three big ones that I've kind of worked on in my career. There's a there's definitely the, the applications for data science are so vast. It's 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 really astounding. For yeah, sure. and they continue uh-huh. to grow and expand, which is sort of the beautiful thing. I mean, mm-hmm. the the funny thing with that question is like the answer is kind of infinite, right? Mm-hmm. The the capabilities are 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 endless and continuing. Oh, I guess it, by definition, it, infinite can't continue to grow, but. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's, I guess this question is probably more addressed for me. It's how to eat a papaya in the most fulfilling way. Um, I'll probably just make an entire video on that. So we'll, we'll skip that one for now. Um, with, with that being said, where can people learn more about you? Are there any things you're working on right now that you want to share? And, yep. um, you know, what's going on in your life? Yeah, for sure. So a couple things like I'm, you know, you can find me in most places if you Google exactly. So that's E C Z A C H L Y. That's like my handle everywhere. You know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Like you'll you'll find me everywhere with that. Um, another uh, thing, I'm on YouTube with uh, and I'm at Data with Zach on YouTube. Uh, that's my YouTube channel. Doing pretty well. I got a couple of videos there. I want to do a lot more like deeper kind of educational videos there. Uh, one of the things that I've been like looking a lot more into recently has been like web three cryptocurrencies and like uh, decentralized finance and stuff like that. And uh, that kind of space. So I definitely want to do some kind of videos and stuff on that stuff. Like, so I'm going to be doing definitely a lot of stuff there. Going to be doing a lot more podcasts with people as well. So you're going to see a lot more of me like this on the internet. So it should be exciting. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Well, I'll link all of those in the description and in the show notes as well. So everyone should have a breeze finding you and learning more about you. Uh, again, this was such an awesome conversation. I learned so much about your career, your, your experience as a tech lead, a, a lot of information about uh, data engineering as well specifically. So Zach, thank you so much again. And I, I can't wait to share this with everyone. Awesome, yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs>